Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Certification Tips and Tricks to Passing an Exam webinar. Uh, my name is Trip Corbin. I am the CEO and co-founder of EGIS Associates. We've got about 20 years of experience in the geospatial arena. Started out as a land surveyor, uh, worked up, uh, worked into GIS as a GIS professional, um, and even spent some time as an IT network administrator uh, during the course of my career. And what I want to share with you today is some things that I've learned uh, in the course of my career in how to pass these various certification exams. Uh, we've seen an explosion in the number and types of certifications you can get within GIS, as well as an increasing desire by employers for people to have these certifications. Uh, since 2013, I've conducted an annual GIS certification acceptance survey, and through those, I've seen an increasing uh, requirement for folks to have some sort of certification, uh, whether that's a requirement in a direct job description or listing a certification such as GISP as a preferred credential um, in a new position uh, announcement. So I see those happening in an increasing increasing number so that um, it's really important that if you're going to be operating in the, the field of GIS uh, that you begin looking at getting one of these certifications if you don't already have one. And in the course of my career, I've been able to earn a bunch of different certifications. I've got several Microsoft certifications, uh, several ESRI, or ESRI, as they're calling themselves now, certifications. Uh, I have the GISP certification, a certified floodplain manager, CompTIA certified technical trainer. So I've had the opportunity to take multiple certification exams uh, throughout my career. And I'm hoping that I can share some of these experiences with y'all so that you get a better understanding of how these exams work, uh, some tips and guidance, some things you can do to help increase your chances of passing these exams, um, and just, you know, share that experience with you. Uh, I, I think that... Um, you'll find these useful, and especially for anyone that's been out of college for a while, maybe it's been a while since you've taken an exam. So I, I believe that, that this, um, what you'll learn today will be helpful in the, in the long run. Okay. One of the things that I want to clear up, because I, there seems to be a very big misunderstanding about the difference between having a certification, having a license, and or having a certificate or, or degree. Um, certification is strictly a voluntary process. It, there's no legal requirement uh, for you to have a, a certification. It may be uh, a requirement in your you know, HR job description or whatnot, but it's typically a voluntary thing you do to increase your resume. It's a way for you to show that you have certain skills and expertise within a field or technology, but there's no legal requirement for you to, to, to do that, to work in that profession. You can do GIS work without having a certification. There, there's no legal requirement that says in order to um, use GIS, you have to have a certification, at least not in most cases. Um, there are some states that have made certain requirements so that, such that if you're doing work with parcels or maybe you're going out doing field data collection that there is some requirement for having either a certification or a license, uh, but, but Generally speaking, having certification is a voluntary way for you to, to acknowledge and show that you have certain levels of expertise. Licensure, on the other hand, um, is mandatory. 
it is legally required to perform certain functions as a professional within a field. This would be your surveyors, your engineers, your doctors, your lawyers, and so on. There are laws on the books that state in order to do certain things, you have to be a licensed professional or working under the guidance of a licensed professional. And to become a licensed professional in those fields, you have to meet these minimum requirements um, and then practice under these guidelines as indicated in the law. And if you fail to do that, then there is legal action that can be taken against you uh, that can include fines, cease and desists. Um, and if you are licensed and failed to practice under the legal guidelines, then of course you could lose your license, which means you can no longer practice as a professional in that given profession. Again, things like surveying, engineering, um, doctors, lawyers, and so on. Okay, that is a legal uh, requirement. It, it's managed and monitored by the government. Most uh, the most of the governmental uh, agencies uh, that do that have special boards set up for the given licensing uh, to handle and, and monitor that. A certificate, and I'm going to include degrees in this, is is just a way of saying you've completed some training program. That could be a one-hour webinar like this one. Or it could be a four-year degree, you know, undergraduate program. Okay, it's just saying that you've gone through a program as outlined uh, and completed it successfully. And and how they determine completing that successfully could be you just sit there and attend the webinar, or you actually go through, get graded, and meet certain minimum requirements and and all that. But just because you come out with a GIS certificate or a certificate saying you completed a course, or even if you come out with a degree, you know, be it a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD, that doesn't mean you're, you're certified. And it doesn't mean you have a license. Okay? I can have a license and not be certified or have a certificate or degree, potentially. Um, I could have a certification but not having gotten a degree or license. I could have a degree or a, cer a certificate but not be licensed or certified and so on. So you can have, you know, it's possible you could have all three of these or you could have one of these or you could have two of these, but one does not mean you have the other. So, so just because you may have a degree or a GIS certificate or whatnot does not mean you're certified or have a license. That would be something else you would have to do. You'd have to go earn uh, that certificate, that certification, or that license, as outlined by the guidelines for uh, the license or certification you wish to obtain. Okay. So know that these are very different things. Okay. Don't don't assume that you automatically have one of these just because you've completed one of the others. Okay. So if we're looking at certification within GIS. There are two basic types you can go after. You've got technical certification and professional certification. Your technical certification is going to be typically based off a specific platform or software. So like your ESRI technical certification, such as the Desktop Associate, as you see here on uh, this uh, slide, or Microsoft Certified Solution Associate, MCSA. That's another technical certification. Um, or one of the Autodesk certifications, or QGIS, which is currently working to develop their own technical certification uh, through the open source community. Okay? So that's all going to be based on a specific technology, a specific platform. Okay? Your professional certifications are going to be things like GISP. They're going to be not based on a specific platform, but a, a, a more general uh, skills and knowledge and theories associated with that given uh, profession. So ASPRS, uh, photogrammetry, they're going to be all focused on not necessarily the specific software you use to do photogrammetry, but you know the, the basics associated with, with doing photogrammetry, remote sensing, the theories involved behind it. Uh, IWO with tax appraisals and tax mapping are going to be um, 
specific things focused around that industry and the general knowledge associated with that not specific software. So that's the different or part of the differences between these. So when we look at technical certification, typically there's no time requirement, meaning you don't have to have worked with the software a specific amount of time or worked in the field a specific amount of time. You can go at any time, um, sign up to go take one of these exams, pay your money, and go take it. And if you pass it, you pass it and you're certified. If you fail it, you're not certified. Okay? They're going to be platform specific. So you, you're going to take uh, certification exams on Microsoft, on you know, SQL Server, uh, like Microsoft Server, Active Directory, things like that. Or, you know, Esri's, uh, ArcGIS for Desktop, or ArcGIS Server, um, you know, and, and so on. So they're going to be very platform specific, right, focused on that specific technology. Not so much about the, the soft skills or the theories behind it, but do you know which buttons to mash, right? What What is the recommended best practices for that platform based on what the vendor says uh, for that? Okay, and almost all of these are going to be exam-based. Matter of fact, most of these are all going to be computer-based exams. So you're going to go to a test center, based on whoever they've agreed to provide testing, um, and you'll sit down, you'll go to the, the center, uh, you'll show them two forms of ID in most cases. You're not allowed to bring in any sort of electronic devices or paper or pens or anything. You um, all that has to stay outside, and they'll provide you with scratch paper, and you'll go sit down at a computer, they'll log you into the system, and you start taking an exam. You will not find the software that you use or you're testing on loaded on that computer. The only thing you can get to is the exam. You can't get out to, to Google, you can't open ArcMap or Arc Catalog or QGIS or AutoCAD or whatever it happens to be. You're just going to sit there and, and have to, to take that exam. And so you have to know, you know, you really have to know the incident. What are the names of the toolbars? What are the names of the tools? What are, you know, not, not just what you call them, you know, like you, you refer to the, you know, the fine tool in ArcMap as the binocular tool, right? You know, you, you have to know that's really the fine tool, not the binocular tool, because you won't be able to open ArcMap and just click on it, okay? So make sure, you know, you're well-versed in the platform that you're testing on, okay? The benefits of a technical certification are, one, it shows that you have a specific knowledge level with using that specific platform and that you know what the vendor says is the best practices with, with it. It also allows the employer to more easily determine your skill level. I mean, a lot of times we go in to, to, for a new job, we get interviewed by somebody in HR that has no idea what GIS is. They can barely spell it, let alone know how to use it. So having one of these certifications is a good way to kind of get your foot in the door. They can see you're certified by Esri on the platform. So that's a, a, a way for them to understand better what your skill level, that you may actually have some skill with it, not just, you know, blowing smoke at them, as it were, right? And so this then builds our resume. It's a great resume builder, especially if you're just getting started in the field, right? Because you can go take the ESRI desktop entry level exam, and, and it's a pretty basic level, but it shows that you know how to do simple things within ArcMap, that you know how to create a map add a layer, control layer symbology, right? So that could get you started and you don't have to wait the time it takes to get one of the professional certifications because these take time. Most all of these have a minimum time requirement. For example, GISP, you have to have worked in the field for four years of full-time equivalency. Okay, so basically that means you have to work in, the, in GIS, doing GIS work, 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, right, in order to achieve that certification or some combination of part-time and full-time experience that gets you to that full-time equivalency, right? So you can't just come, in most cases, you can't just come out of college with a four-year degree and get your GISP. It's going to take you some time to, to get there. But what these do show is that you have a good understanding of the theory theory and overall knowledge of the industry. 
so that it's not like you just go to Esri and you click the project tool to move this data from one coordinate system to another, but you understand when you use that tool in ArcGIS, what's happening. You understand how the datum shifts work, uh, what a transformation is, unit conversions, all these things that happen when you go through from one coordinate system and project to another. Okay, it's not just which button to push. Okay, It gives you that overall um, knowledge. Most of these do have an exam that tests you on the overall theory and knowledge base just to verify that, that not only have you had the experience, but you have a good general understanding of all the, the foundational knowledge areas associated with that given profession. In addition, they'll add a code of ethics and rules of behavior. This helps provide guidance on how you should work, uh, and what you can and can't do, how to help react to certain situations, and things of that, that arena. It gives you that kind of um, guidance on how you should perform as a professional, right? Um, and that also means there are certain things you can't do. So as a licensed professional, or not licensed, sorry, certified professional, you know, you should refer to these, and it may mean that when you're asked to do something, um, that you have to tell somebody no, right? Or find a different approach that keeps it within that uh, code of ethics and rules of behavior or conduct that's associated with that. And lastly, it requires continuing education. So with those, I'm sorry, with the technical certifications, those you're typically certified on a specific version of the software, right? So you may be certified on ArcGIS, you know, ArcGIS Desktop 10.3, okay? When 10.4 rolls out, you may or may not be certified on that one. Esri, in this case, may require you to certify on that new version. And the same when 10.5 rolls out. So you're always certified on a given version with the technical certifications. Professional certifications don't work that way. They, they typically have some sort of renewal process that you have to go through that shows you are continuing to work in the profession, uh, educating yourself, and so on. So you're staying up on the latest technologies and trends. Right. So having a professional certification, especially if you can actually get this written in as part of your HR requirements, can be great for you because this means that you can require a training budget. It's not something they can just do away with, um, which is a big problem we've been having since budgets uh, started really shrinking uh, in 2008. And one of the first things, at least in GIS, they got rid of was training because in most cases there wasn't a requirement for continuing education. Now with a professional-based certification, getting that written in as part of your job description, you now have a requirement to have continuing education, allow you to continue to grow within the field, learn about new technologies. Um, see what's happening, what are new trends, and so on. And in a field like GIS that is constantly changing as new technologies are coming out, things like LiDAR, uh, UAVs, drones, um, new relational databases, mobile technologies, web technologies, and so on, you know, to, to maintain your, your skill set as a professional. I mean, you have to have that. There's just no way to get around it. So we want to do that. So what this does, by having a professional certification, it does a, a lot of, of different things, right? It shows a proven level of knowledge and skill that you have gone through and, and gotten that. It helps other professionals that we work with recognize us as, as equals or as other professionals. I know I worked with a, an engineering company for 18 and a half years. And during that time, I learned very quickly that if you didn't have magic letters after your name, that the engineers and surveyors um, that I worked with really didn't take you that seriously. Uh, they tend to not regard you at the same level as they were with their magic letters. So this helps get you up to that level, right, to put you on the same footing with these other professionals that we work with. Hopefully it'll increase your earning potential. I know that some places actually will give you a raise if you get a certification. Uh, for example, Florence County, South Carolina, if you get the GISP certification, you get a $2,000 a year raise. Uh, and they actually require the GISP 
to if you're going to be a GIS project manager, department head, or so on, right? And of course, as I was talking about earlier, it promotes your own professional development by having that continuing education requirement, uh, challenging you on new technologies, and so on. So there's a lot of good benefit for you going out and, and getting these certifications. So let's let's talk about the exams a little bit. And what can you expect when you go take one of these exams? Well, there's several different types of questions you may encounter in the course of these exams. You know, true, false, multiple choice, and multiple answer. True, false are probably the easiest. You know, you have a 50-50 chance of getting those right. Um, and that's why several exams have begun moving away from those because they're too uh, easy to just guess at. Uh, but you still may encounter those. Multiple choice and multiple answer are probably the most common types of questions you'll actually see on these types of, or, or on these certification exams. Okay, so multiple choice are, are, are pretty straightforward. They will give you some question or scenario, and that's something else that you've got to look out for. They they tend to like, especially in the, the technical certification side of things, uh, some scenario-based questions. So they may ask you um, a question that, that would be something like, uh, you receive data from an outside source. The metadata indicates that it's in the same coordinate system as your existing data. However, when you bring this external data into your map, it doesn't align properly with your existing data. It actually is displayed far to the east of your existing data. However, the scale appears to be the same. Which of the following might be uh, the cause uh, of, of the data not displaying where you expect it to. And then give you A, B, C, or D, and you have to go through those and pick it. But that's, that's a very common style question where they give you that scenario, and then you have to, to choose the proper answer. Of course, the one thing they like to do, so it makes it a little harder, is they'll also throw in the um, none of the above or all of the above. Right, so you may, if you're going through, because one of the tricks with a multiple choice uh, question is you go through and you start throwing out those that are obviously wrong, and you limit it to the, the hopefully, the two best answers, right, um, and so, or three, and so if you start getting two or three, and they have them all the above, then you start to question, is it, is it possible that one of the ones I threw out may be correct, too? So that does challenge you in your knowledge of that uh, to, to ensure you really do know that. Multiple answer is even trickier because it's very similar to the multiple choice, but you have to select multiple answers. And they may or may not tell you how many you need to select. They may just say select all that apply. That's how the GISP exam works. It'll say select all that apply, and you have to figure out, do I need to select one, two, three, four um, in there? And if you don't select all of the proper answers, you get the question wrong. Now, the ESRI certification exams will actually tell you select the, the three that apply or select the, the two best answers or something along those lines on there, but as I said, not all of those do. So make sure you read those questions carefully um, and you really understand the, the meaning because another thing that they like to, to do with these scenario-based questions is try to confuse you by putting more information in there than you actually need. So be careful of that. Make sure you read through um, the, the question thoroughly. So an example of that, of including more information than you may need, might be something like this. You're, you're working with your economic development director to help select potential new sites for a business that wish to, wishes to locate to your area. They're, 
their requirements for the new location uh, include having a parcel that is uh, greater than one acre but less than three acres um, located on a commercially zoned parcel <coughs> pardon me um, be near water and sewer service and have direct access from a major road uh, this new business will be a storefront selling retail to its customers it's expecting to have um, over 100 customers to, uh, per day visiting the store. Which of the following SQL queries would allow you to properly select parcels less than three acres but greater than one acre? Okay. So they throw a whole bunch of stuff in that question that really has nothing to do with the real question at hand, which is what is the proper syntax for the SQL query that would allow you to select the right size parcel. Okay, so make sure you read those questions very carefully as we go through those. As you're preparing for the exam, so you're getting ready to study, you're, you're starting down the path uh, of making sure you, you have the skills and knowledge for the exam, you want to do some things. First off, go to the exam page and make sure you know what they're testing on. I know that seems simple, but you'd be surprised. A lot of folks, like for the ESRI exams, oh, I've been using ArcGIS desktop for 10 years. I, I know it inside and out. And then they go sit for the exam, and they start realizing that it start, it's asking about um, how to write uh, a, a Python labeling expression. And they've never used labeling. They use annotation instead. Right? So th they're lost. So make sure you verify what knowledge areas the exam is testing on. Do not assume that you know. I don't care if it's a technical exam and you've been using that software for 20 years. Make sure you know what the test is on and then compare that to your own knowledge level. You know, we have a tendency, especially those of us that have been in the profession for a while, to get focused on a, a specialty. You know, we're, we specialize in analysis, or we specialize in database building, or we specialize in application development, or, you know, editing or something. Remember, all of these tests are going to be much more broad-based than your specialty. Okay, if it's an ArcGIS for Desktop exam, it's going to test on a wide range of skills and functionality in ArcGIS for Desktop. If it's a professional exam, like the GISP, it's going to test across a broad knowledge area that all deals with GIS, the GIS industry, but it may be more than what you do. It's going to test on basic field data collection techniques. It's going to test on basic database design, some very basic application development type questions and programming questions, basic data editing concepts, and so on. So make sure you, you, know, you know what that skill level is. Uh, the knowledge areas and compare it to where you are. You know, what do you know? What are you weak in? Right? Um, if there are any bu books or study aids, make sure you get a hold of those and start going through that, reading through all of those, especially in those areas you're weak. You want to focus on your weak areas first. Right? Build up to those and then you can work on your strong areas just to make sure you, you understand things the same way they do. Okay. If you can, look for others that have taken the exam. Ask them for guidance. What kind of things did they do to help prepare? Now, you do have to keep in mind that for most all of these exams, anybody that's taken one has had to agree to a non-disclosure agreement. So they cannot tell you, or they're not supposed to tell you anyway, exactly what's on the exam. They're not supposed to give you, you know, sample questions that they saw on the exam. They're not supposed to tell you the exact content of the exam, but they can tell you what they did to help study. They can tell you little things that they experienced in generic terms. Um, they can potentially tell you kind of the style of the questions that they experienced, if not the exact content of those questions. But it's always good to find those people out and, and, and really feel them out, what they thought, how they did, whether they passed or failed the exam. You know, and it, it actually probably a good idea to find a, a mix of both. 
so you can find, you know, start to look at, well, what worked and what didn't work for those people. And then lastly, if you can find practice exams. Uh, this is a little bit harder for those of us in GIS than it is for those in IT or engineering or surveying or whatever, uh, because the certifi certification exams are still relatively new by comparison to other fields, uh, but there are some out there, right? Uh, and of course, trying to find a study prep course would be a good one. So for example, EGIS Associates and Geospatial Training Services offers a ArcGIS Desktop exam prep course for the associate certification on ArcGIS Desktop that includes some practice exams. Uh, ERISA has been developing a GISP exam uh, prep workshop uh, that they just recently launched at GIS Pro in 2016 up in Toronto and are going to be expanding that. So look for those programs as well. They can help, uh, help prepare you for that exam uh, too. Okay. Make sure you understand the lingo, the, the terminology associated uh, with that field. And this is difficult because what I found in my experiences is that each shop, each organization tends to develop their own internal language that is based on the industry language, but has its own, for lack of a better term, dialect. For example, I've been to some places where everything is a shape file. Right? Doesn't matter if it's stored in a geodatabase, in an AutoCAD drawing, in a microstation drawing, uh, in an access database or whatever. Anything that's used in GIS is a shape file. Of course, those of us that have been around Azure long enough know that that's just not case. There's a very big difference between a true shape file and other storage formats like the geodatabase or uh, DWG for AutoCAD or, or whatnot. Right, so you want to be careful. Make sure you understand that. One of the best examples I have for that is the term feature class. Okay. Most people associate feature classes with a geodatabase, and that's where you would store a feature class in a geodatabase. And that is true. You do store feature classes in the geodatabase. Um, however, Esri actually looks at the feature class a lot more broadly to Esri, a feature class is any collection of features that shares a common geometry type, meaning a point or a line or a polygon, a common attribute table, and a common spatial reference. So that actually means that while geodatabases store feature classes, a shapefile also stores a feature class. It stores a single feature class. The old Esri coverage format from Arc Info Workstation also stores feature classes. It can store multiple ones. But so does an AutoCAD DWG store feature classes. So does a MicroStation DGN. So does a DXF file. So feature class is a much broader term than just things stored in a geodatabase, okay, uh, for example, okay. Uh, so just make sure you understand the lingo of the industry and or the software. And that's another thing. There's a big difference between taking the technical certification and the lingo associated with it and the, the professional certification and the generic lingo associated uh, with an, an entire industry. So keep that in mind. Just be, you know, there may be differences between vendors on the t on terminology um, and the industry in general. So you always have to keep in mind: Am I taking the a professional exam? Am I taking a technical exam? Am I taking the technical? What vendor am I referencing? So make sure you know what what each you know all the nuances of each one of those are, and focus on that specific exam you're going to be taking on. Uh, flashcards are a great way to help learn that lingo and make sure you know the, the meaning associated with that given exam and or vendor, um, you know, using things like, you know, creating fun ways like a, a, a lingo jeopardy, you know, from, you know, Alex Trebek type thing, uh, anything that helps really challenge you to, to do this. And, you know, it's not a bad idea to form a study group, right, that can help go through these. So if you can get two or three or four people or more that are all studying for the same exam, you can help each other. 
um, get through this and, and focus on different areas of strength. So somebody's really strong in editing and help those that aren't, and, and somebody that's strong in analysis because analysis can help those that aren't. So you, know, you want to make sure you do that. For the technical exams, it's always good to go back to the vendor's training material. So if you've taken an Autodesk course um, or an Esri course or a Hexagon, Erdos course or Geomedia course, go back and review those training materials because those are going to be from the vendor and be set up so that they use what the vendor thinks is the best practices. And it's always key with these technical exams to remember you're focused on what the vendor thinks is the best way to do things. <clears throat> that may not be the same way you do them in your shop. It may be um, a very different method from what you do in your shop. What I found in a lot of, a lot of um, organizations is that the workflows they use tend, tended to come from necessity. They, they've, they had to get something done. They beat their head against the wall till they figured it out, and they did it. That may not be what the vendor thinks is the best way to do it. I'm not saying that it's wrong the way you do it, but it's not what the vendor considers the best practice. And these technical certification exams are always going to focus on what the vendor thinks is the best practice, not what you do in your shop. Um, they may be the same, but they may be different. So anything that helps you go through those best practices and training materials will do that, official training materials from the vendor. Um, look through the help, which often will include tutorials, right? So the help will give you specific workflows and suggestions on when tools should be used, how they should be used in conjunction with other tools. Uh, I said they'll often include tutorials that show you how to put those tools into practice. Again, using what the vendor thinks is the best practice. Then go back and look at any white papers they've written on specific functionality, uh, implementations, and so on. Right, that's also going to show you best practices and ways they view that those tools and functionalities should be put into practice, right? Because that will help guide you through those scenario questions, okay? which is always really good. Okay? Uh, before the exam, don't over cram. You know, most you know most of us aren't in college anymore. We need a good night's sleep. We can't stay up all night long cramming for the test. Um, and still be good for the exam. So make sure you get a good night's sleep. Your full eight hours, six hours, whatever you need to function uh, properly, do it. I know me, I've got to get, you know, six to seven hours sleep at a minimum to, to be any good the next day. But I'm an old guy, right? If you're younger and can do better, fine. But you need your time for your brain to rest so you don't have cram brain is what I call it. We're just, you've got so much in there, you can't sort it out, you're overloaded. Take time, let your brain relax, focus, um, and, and just get that sleep, okay? Also, this isn't college. You get to choose when you take the exam. Pick the time of the day that you're good, right? If you know you're not a morning person, don't schedule the exam in the morning. If you know you're, you, you've got to have two or three cups of coffee before you're really on your, sharp edge, then make sure you have time to get those cups of coffee you need. If you know you do better after lunch, then schedule it after lunch. If you know you are a morning person and you wake up full of energy and ready to go, then schedule it first thing in the morning. Pick the time that works best for you. You don't want to go into an exam been being dead beat tired or being bouncing off the walls. You know, you're going to have to be in there for anywhere from two to four hours depending on the exam, right? So just schedule the time when you're at your best, okay? Now, when you're actually sitting there to take the exam, make sure you use your time. They're going to give you, like I said, two to four hours depending on the exam. I think the Esri desktop exams are two and a half hours. I think GISP is three to four hours. Um, use all that time. I know it's it's hard. You get in there, you're nervous. You really want to be anywhere other than sitting in the test center. You just want to be done and over with. So you're going to want to rush through the exam. Don't do it. You don't get any extra points for setting the world speed record for taking that exam. Okay, take your time. 
read each question thoroughly. Read each answer thoroughly. Do not skim them. I generally recommend a three-pass process for the exam. So first pass, I'm going through, I'm looking at all the questions, reading them, looking at the answers carefully. All those I know immediately, I'm going to answer. All those that I'm unsure of, I'm going to mark so I can come back to. And I'm going to break those up into two categories. I'm going to mark those down that I can narrow, I narrow it down to a couple of answers, two, three, but I have some clue as to what the answer might be. And I'm going to mark those down on a sheet of scratch paper uh, so I can go back and hit those. Then I'm going to mark those down that I have no clue of. Right? And I've read them and I, none of them make sense. None of the answers make sense. I have no idea. I'm going to mark those down in another column. Okay? So I can hit those in, in another pass. So once I finish that first pass, by the way, when you go through that first pass, go with your first response, your gut answer. I would say 70% of the time, people that go back and second guess themselves and change an answer from what their gut told them it was the first time, get it wrong. So go with your gut. Don't second guess yourself. Most times people go with their gut and then overthink the question. They, they make it more complicated than it should be. Usually your first gut answer is the right one. Okay, so stick with that. So once you've done your first pass through, you've answered all the ones you know for sure, then go, you want to go back to those that you have narrowed it down that you have some idea. Okay, go back through those, answer them um, as best you can. Okay, and then lastly, hit all those you don't know and at least guess because any anything that's answered, or I'm sorry, anything that's not answered is wrong. So at least put something down. You might get lucky. Okay. But again, take your time, read them thoroughly, take, you know, do not rush through the exam. No matter how nervous you are, how uncomfortable you are, use this three pass method and, and you'll do, you'll have a much greater chance of passing the exam, trust me. I, I failed some exams too, I, I don't pass every one I've ever taken, I have failed them and usually I, when I do, uh, it's because I rush, it's because I don't do this three pass method. So it's a very, it, for me, it's a proven path to success. Um, I won't guarantee 100% of the time that it'll, it'll work, but I, I do much better when I do it this way than uh, when I just rush through it or I just do one pass and, and done. Okay. As you're reading the questions, be careful for trick words. They, they like to do this. They'll put in most, least, best, minimal, or maximum. So, for example, uh, you may get a question that would be something like this, uh, and I'm going to use Esri as an example. You're editing data within ArcMap. You wish to edit the data in order to maintain, or so that it maintains, the current spatial relationships between those features, so that they maintain their adjacency, connectivity, or coincidence. Which of the following would be the best method in order to accomplish this goal? Okay. So when you see the word best, that's probably a good indication that of the answers there, there will be multiple answers that could achieve the goal, but you have to know which one the vendor thinks is best. Right. So they may have A, enable snapping, uh, to ensure the features are properly snapped together. B, turn on vertices and make sure vertices are moved as close together as possible. C, create a map topology and use the edit tools found on the topology toolbar. D, none of the above. And in that case, the answer would be C, use a map topology. That would be what Esri would consider the best method to accomplish that task. Um, potentially, you could do it with A and B, uh, A or B, but it's not the best method. <clears throat> so 
C would be the best. So watch out for those. Uh, they may ask you, what is the, you know, maximum licensing level needed to edit data in an enterprise geodatabase? Okay. Well, if the, you see enterprise geodatabase, that means it's using ArcGIS Server and SDE, which means the maximum level would be advanced, ArcGIS Desktop Advanced, formerly known as ArcInfo. Okay? So be careful of that. And as I mentioned, with scenarios, make sure you can sort out the important from the non-important. Um, it's not unusual for them to try to put in more detail than you need to actually answer the question in there. And if you're still not sure exactly what the right answer is, at least try to figure out what the wrong answers are. You know, and that, that's not uncommon to go through and, you know, at least know what's not right. You may not know exactly what the right one is, but if, at least you can narrow it down that increases your chances of guessing the, the right one. And the other important thing, kind of going back to the pass, the multiple pass uh, process, is that I found that through the exam, you may find a question later in the exam that helps you answer an earlier question, right, that, that asks something similar but in a slightly different manner that maybe you understand or they'll actually maybe hint at or give the answer within the question later on. And it's just, as I said, uh, be careful, and that's why I say read those things carefully and go through that multiple pass. Also, when you're taking the technical exams, remember you're limited to a single solution, right? So if you're taking one of the ESRI exams, everything's limited to ArcGIS. There's no, I would export it to uh, Excel, an Excel spreadsheet, um, calculate new values using equations within the spreadsheet, and then e export back to uh, a common delimited text file that I would then bring back into ArcGIS and perform the rest of my, that, that's no, it's never you bounce it out, you know. Um, uh, with that. So you're working in that single solution and you know just like Microsoft would never ask you to, or tell you the best practice would be to bounce something out into an Apple based solution, right? It's just not going to happen. Okay? And they're going to be based on again what the vendor thinks is the best practices and I keep hammering on that but it's true. Remember what the vendor says is the proper workflows for things may be completely different than what you do in your shop. And again, I'm not trying to tell you what you do in your shop is wrong, um, but the vendor may have a, a better, or what they consider a better methodology. Also, something to remember is that within applications, especially these for these technical certifications, there's usually more than one way to do or to access some functionality. So, for example, um, within ArcGIS, in order to change the labeling engine from the ESRI standard label engine to the Matplex label engine, there's more than one way to do that. You can right click on the data frame, go to the data frame properties, and on the generals chat tab, change the labeling engine there. Or you can turn on the labeling toolbar, and from the drop down, the label drop down menu there at the beginning of the label toolbar, you can change the label engine there. Uh, I believe you can also go under Customize in ArcMap, go to ArcMap Options, and change the default label engine there. Okay? So always keep in mind that there's most, often more than one way to, to do or perform a function. And these tests are, are liable to test you on all of the potential ways of doing something. So make sure you're well aware of, of those functions as well. Okay. Well, I, I hope you've picked up a tip or trick uh, that will prove useful when you're going to take your exam. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or, or comments. I'm always happy to, to help uh, if I'm able to. Uh, there is my uh, email address and my phone number with extension. As I said, I'm always happy to help answer uh, questions. Again, um, if you are looking to take the Esri Desktop Associate Certification, uh, we do offer a course, an exam prep course for that. It's uh, really been very successful. I've got over a 90% pass rate for those that have taken that course and reported their results back to me. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, 
please check our training schedule, which is on our, our website, as well as Geospatial Training Services website. Um, and then don't forget the ERISA workshop for the GISP exam and expect that to continue to, to grow. So with that, hope you have a great rest of your day and uh, thank you for attending the webinar.